like to start off by thanking everybody who made this webinar possible and to thank you for joining us for a few minutes for this webinar. You know, in today's cybersecurity landscape, it's really not a question of if we are going to be attacked, it's a question of when. So it makes sense for companies and individuals to have awareness and training regarding the potential threats so that we can protect ourselves against those types of attacks and threats that could compromise our security. So let's start off by taking a look at a really, really common security threat, and that is a phishing email attack. So let's imagine that Bob has logged in one morning at his computer at work, and an email shows up, and in that email there's some call to action. Now, if that email is a malicious email and it's a phishing attack, if the user clicks on the link in that email or if they click on the attachment, it's very likely going to result in a compromise of either the local computer with malware being installed potentially, or if the user clicks on a link, that link could take the user out to a malicious website that is made to look like an official website, like for a bank or something else. And if the user is then further encouraged to log in to verify their account, the attacker who's collecting that information on the fake website now has the username and password of that user. In this case, it's Bob, and Bob's password has just been compromised. So as an example of a phishing email attack, here's one that I received recently. It said it came from blockchain and has your blockchain confirmation code. It came in at 3.54 in the morning. It had this text and then it had this link that they wanted me to click on. Now, as we look at that link there, it looks like it might be okay. HTTPS colon whack whack blockchain.info. There's nothing wrong with that site. That's a legitimate site. However, as I hovered over that link, it actually displayed the real URL, which was nothing like this link right here. So as a result of simply being aware that there's potential for a phishing attack, we would want to make sure we never click any links in an email and never download any attachments if there's any suspicion whatsoever that this is a bogus email, which in fact this one is. And the question may come up, well, Keith, then how are we going to verify our account? Maybe we want to log into our account and verify that everything's okay. That's a good idea. And what we're going to do is we're not. We're not going to use any links or any options that are in the email. We'll simply open up a separate browser and we'll go to that site ourselves. Then we'll log in as we normally do, and then we can verify our accounts. The key is never act on anything from within the email that was sent because a phishing email is malicious and its goal is to compromise the user or system in some way. And that's why we'd want to be aware of it and never follow those links or open the attachments in a malicious email. Another area in cybersecurity where there's tons and tons of vulnerabilities is passwords. So let's take our user Bob again, who's going to log on to computer two. If the password that Bob uses here in the corporate network is the same one that he uses at home, and if it's the same password he uses at 15 or 16 different sites that he visits and works with, the challenge is if the password is compromised at any one of those many sites and locations that he uses it, and the attacker gets that password, the attacker could then start using that password or attempt to use that password at other locations and sites that Bob goes to, including perhaps a login to the corporate network if the password is the same, or possibly the attacker VPNing in using the username and password of Bob because it's the same password and works almost everywhere. So one solution to that is to not use the same password at multiple locations and sites. So we'd want to have training for our users and for ourselves that that's a bad idea to use the same password everywhere. And if a person thinks, wow, I wonder if my password has been compromised at any of the sites or locations that I go to, there are several ways to find out, including one website, which is called haveibeenpwned.com. And here's the URL right here. So what we could do is we could go ahead and we could put in an email address. For example, let's use an email address of greg at yahoo.com. And the term pwned comes back from a video game from many, many years ago where the programmers had a typo. And instead of saying owned, the typo had P-W-N-E-D. And it was in the game for quite, for quite a while. And so the term just kind of caught on. So anytime we see the concept of being pwned or pwned, it's referring to being defeated. So what we'll go ahead and do is we'll put in greg at yahoo.com and we'll click on the pwned over here with a question mark. It's going to search the database and says, oh no, pwned, meaning that that user account has been compromised on over 50 breach sites. And if we scroll down the list, it can give us more detail on those sites where it was compromised and when it happened. So if you know Greg <laughs> at yahoo.com, you might want to give him a heads up and say, hey buddy, you might want to change your passwords everywhere. And when you do, don't use the same password at each of the places that you go. 
So let's imagine that Greg did get the message that he should use different passwords at multiple locations. How does a person keep track of that? And I have seen some amazingly scary ways of people keeping track of all their usernames and passwords that they're using at various sites. Some people have a contacts list, and in those contact lists, they have the actual username and password they're using. So if that contact list is compromised, boom, all those usernames and passwords are now compromised. Or if somebody has a text document that stores all of that information, whether it's stored on the computer or in the cloud, if somebody gets access to that text document, that's a major security compromise for all those usernames and passwords. So one of the solutions to both creating adequate and complex passwords and having different passwords and keeping track of them all is to use some type of a password manager. Now, you might be thinking, well, if I don't have a password manager yet, uh, which one should I use? And that's a great question. So here's a couple of ideas of what a person might do. If you work at a company that has an IT department, you could ask the IT department for their recommendations regarding a password manager. You're very likely going to get some great feedback from them. In addition, you could do a Google search for top 10 password managers or top password managers and take a look at those options as well. You could also use forums like Reddit as well to get opinions based on password managers. And then once you decide on one, go ahead and start using it. And most password managers have major benefits, including the ability to have complex passwords and different passwords for all the sites and services that we visit. It can also retrieve those passwords so it makes them easy to use, whether it's on mobile devices or on computers. And most password managers have the ability to securely back them up so that if we physically lose one of our devices, whether it's a phone or a tablet or a computer, we can access a secured backup and still have access to our passwords on a new device or a different device. Another important aspect regarding protecting our accounts and our logins is to use multi-factor authentication. Sometimes it's referred to as two-factor authentication. And here's the basics of multi-factor authentication. There are three categories of factors. We'll call them category A, category B, and category C. In category A, it's something that we know. So if we think about something that you and I know, uh, that a great example of that would be, for example, a password. We know our password. In category B, it could be something that you have. And that's something that a person could have. It could be, for example, a bank card, a physical bank card with a magnetic strip or a chip in it. Or it could be uh, some kind of a security device that generates a code every 60 seconds. And that code that's generated every 60 seconds could be something that we have as well. And then category C is something that you are. And that would refer to biometrics, the way we speak, uh, our thumbprints, our fingerprints a scan of some portion of our eyeball, or a handprint. Those are all examples of something that we are. So the concept with multi-factor authentication is that if A, B, and C are different factor categories, we want to pull from at least two. So going back to Bob and logging in, if we do multi-factor authentication, we could require, for example, a password for Bob and also maybe a fingerprint scan and require both of those before we allow Bob to log in. That's an example of multi-factor authentication. Another option would be to have Bob log in with something that he knows, like a password, as well as maybe a card that has a digital certificate on the chip on that card, and have both of those requirements in place as part of multi-factor authentication before Bob is able to log in and access the network. So I've got a question for you. What if you and I, as end users at home, want to improve our own security by implementing multi-factor authentication? Is it possible? And the answer is yes, it is. There's lots of really cool authenticator applications that are available to the common person, the common man or common woman, including Google Authenticator. And on the right is an example of LastPass Authenticator. And the basic concept is this. If we want to use multi-factor authentication for a Google login, for example, for our Google account, we'd first of all install the Authenticator application, whether it's Google Authenticator or LastPass Authenticator or one of the many other authenticator apps that are out there. So we have this application available on our smartphone or our tablet, and then we'd log on to our Google account. We'd go to the security section, specify that we want to enable multi-factor or two-factor authentication. As we walk through that process, it will present us a QR code on the screen. We'd then take our authenticator application. We'd say that we want to add a new entry. Then we use the camera on the mobile device to scan that QR code. And then we create a new entry just for Google for our user account. 
And then once multi-factor authentication is enabled for that account, when we log in, we're gonna have to provide our username, our password, and whatever the six digit code is that shows up here at that moment in the Google Authenticator app or on whatever Authenticator app that we happen to be using for the multi-factor authentication. And that way, even if the password is somehow compromised, the attacker won't have the six digit code that he needs to log in. So that's yet another way of protecting our security when we log into systems by using multi-factor authentication. Another huge problem is the concept of malicious software or malware. And to protect against this, one of the major things we wanna do is just be aware that if something seems too good to be true, or if there's free something that we're about to download and install, if it's coming from a legitimate source, there's a good possibility that there is no malicious software embedded in the application you're about to install. However, if we download software from a suspicious source, there's a great probability that it's also got some malicious software that's about to be installed along with the application that you want. So a couple of ways of defending against this is to never install any software on your computer unless you've taken steps to verify the validity of that software. Another step that we could take is to have limited rights on our computer systems. So going back to Bob here on this computer at the corporate network, if Bob on this company computer has limited rights where he doesn't even have the permissions to install software, that's going to help Bob not install malicious software. Because if Bob is tricked into installing the software and he tries to install it, if his user account doesn't have enough permissions to install the software, that can help prevent malicious software from being installed. That same concept also applies to Bob as he goes home. If there's a family computer or multiple computers, if they've logged on as admin with full King Kong rights, that's dangerous because malicious software, if they're tricked into installing it, can be installed on this computer. So a good practice is to have a limited account, meaning not admin privileges, and use that for your day-to-day -day access. And then if you need to log on occasionally as administrator to change user account settings or something else, you do that on a limited basis. But most of the time, if we're logged in as a user with limited rights, that will assist us in helping to protect against malicious software or having us being tricked into installing malicious software because we simply won't have the rights as the currently logged in user to have that software installed. So that's not a foolproof method, but it is a good step in the right direction. We'd also wanna have current antivirus and anti-malware software and have it updated. And then if warning signs do go off, for example, warning, this website's not safe, we wanna heed that and don't say, well, just go ahead and go anyway. And the same is true if we're going to websites that have HTTPS and we get a message that the certificate couldn't be verified. We simply wanna pause on all those messages and not continue. Don't just say, yeah, I'll accept the risk and go. We wanna take the feedback from the systems that are warning us about potential cybersecurity risks and heed them. Another important aspect that we as end users can do to help protect ourselves is to have some type of credit monitoring system in place that warns us when our credit is being looked into. And most credit monitoring services have abilities to set thresholds in place so we can get warned, for example, if an account goes over a certain amount or if there's a change of so much of a percent in an account. And that way, when we get the alert, we can jump on that. And in light of the recent huge security breaches with one of the major credit reporting bureaus, and I'm not gonna mention Equifax, as a result of that, it also would be wise for most people to take a few minutes and actually freeze their credit with all three of the bureaus. And that way, if they're frozen, some malicious person who's attempting to do identity theft against you won't have access to those credit bureaus. And that's a good step in the right direction in preventing identity theft as well.